Just check whether the, the remote control is working properly. Great. Yes. Okay. Oh, sorry, Kathleen. What is your affiliation? So good morning, everybody. Uh, uh, I'm very uh, happy and proud to introduce uh, Kathleen Howell from Purdue University, who will speak uh, on uh, orbital infrastructure to support space exploration. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, I want to thank the organizers for the invitation. I appreciate it a lot. And I've enjoyed the meeting thus far. So today, I'm going to talk about some current work that we're doing. And in particular, uh, it's joint with um, some colleagues. Uh, Diane Davis and Ryan Whitley are at NASA Johnson Space Center. And then the others are my students. Uh, this has to do with uh, our current project because it shows, a, and I thought I'd talk about it here because it's a different application for the restricted three-body problem that's actually going into practice from the spacecraft side. So I think it's uh, interesting to see that uh, it's actually being played out. For a long time, quite a bit, ever since you know IC3, we've seen spacecraft missions are slowly sort of adopting or getting into the uh, capabilities that are available with the uh, three-body problem. And this one in particular, IC3, from 19, uh, the launch in 1978, should be familiar to everybody just because of the, let's see, there we go, because that's right on the cover of the journal. So everybody should be familiar with this one. But there's actually been more applications as well, and one of the more recent ones was Genesis. Genesis launched in 01, came back in 04, but this was the trajectory in the Sun Earth system. Now, both IC3 and Genesis all were applications in the Sun Earth system. More recently, uh, Artemis was an application in the Earth Moon system, but also heavily leveraged the capabilities of the trajectory design in the multi body problem in order to enable a very uh, propellant challenge spacecraft to accomplish a lot of different things in this particular application. Of course, back in the Sun-Moon system, this was uh, path, uh, Lisa Pathfinder, which is also just ending its, its role. But these were mostly, outside of Artemis, these were mostly robotic spacecraft that actually had an opportunity to utilize some different types of orbits because of applications or new or solutions that were available in the three-body problem. Recently, however, as we look at the global exploration roadmap, which is based on the human spacecraft uh, problem, this uh, document lays out a plan that many of the space agencies agreed to, which always mentioned, which has been mentioning L2 type orbits for a long time for the libration, L2 libration plan. So this is a human application that putting humans in these kinds of orbits would also take place as long as they were eventually meeting their goals of human exploration of the solar system. So NASA, as a matter of fact, in their most recent delivery, which was just last March, talked about or based on that global exploration roadmap, came up with what the goals are going to be in the short term, or at least as of today, uh, for the U.S. And the goal is to sort of develop a capability that will allow them to be more nimble in responding to whatever the destinations are, and sort of build up the infrastructure in cis lunar space so that they'll be able to move humans out further and be able to take uh, advantage of co coming opportunities. So the focus right now is on a multi-use ev uh, evolvable space infrastructure, which means the hardware, but that also means everything that moves with the hardware. They're doing it with, um, or the focus is on all the international partners that are a, a part of the uh, global exploration roadmap. 
So, the human spaceflight program from the US perspective has been sort of laid out in this plan to start with where we are now, which is mostly in LEO, as far as the human spacecraft program is concerned, low Earth orbit, the space station, and so on. But the goal is to utilize those near-Earth capabilities to test some other systems. And that's what's going on now. Then throughout the 20s, the idea is to move into cislunar space, everything near the, uh, from the Earth out to the lunar orbit, and try to develop some capabilities, but also to develop some hardware. So the Deep Space Gateway is going to be the structure right now that they're planning to put out there. And then in the, the 2030s, to move beyond and, and do translunar type activities um, for the human program. So that's what the, the plan actually is. And it starts with this evolvable infrastructure, and in, in particular, finding a cislunar staging orbit that they can use for a long period of time. So if they put humans in this staging orbit and have a facility there, the goal is that it can support the human program, but it, that it should also be able to support the robotic program and be able to do a lot of the science, or be the taking off point for a lot of the science missions and so on. So the question was, how, what were they gonna find and what kind of orbit were they going to look for? So they started out actually um, looking at a range of orbits in the lunar vicinity that they could use for the staging orbit to place this facility. Now, how soon this will actually happen, I don't know, but uh, th this is the most serious effort that I've seen in the US at putting humans in a different type of orbit out by the moon. So these are the kinds of orbits that they looked at, and some are very familiar, particularly the top few. But the bottom three are all orbits that are recognizable for a restricted three-body problem. And those are the ones that were seriously considered. Now the bottom one, which is the distant retrograde orbit, or the DRO, is in fact, that's that large blue orbit out there around the moon. It also encompasses L1 and L2 in the Earth-Moon system. That's actually implemented for uh, EM1. Now, EM-1 is the Exploration Mission 1, which is to launch in 2019, and it's going to test out the rocket as well as some of the other uh, capabilities that you need in order to move humans out. So that's actually a go, and that's uh, going to be in, in a DRO. But the one that was chosen for the staging orbit is actually the near rectilinear halo orbit. So they looked at just a regular L2 halo, but they focused on, and what they're working on right now is the near rectilinear halo. At the current time, it's scheduled, um, the next mission to follow on that is EM2, and that's scheduled for the 21-22 timeframe. Now, humans won't go right into this because they need a mission to test it out. So the EM2 will have humans on it, but they're going, but they're going on to a different uh, orbit that goes around the moon and returns, but there's also a part of the mission, there's another device that's going to go into, right now, is planned to go into the near rectilinear halo orbit to test it out and to put a propulsion unit in that orbit that will be available for humans on EM3. So EM3, which is a little bit later in the 20s, is the one that's supposed to take the humans there. So, just a little uh, review, I guess of what this particular orbit is that they want to use for the staging orbit. And that comes from the restricted three-body problem. And in this particular case, these are families of L1 and L2 halo orbits. In particular, if I look at, here's the moon, the Earth is over in this direction in the Earth-Moon problem. These are southern members of the halo family, so this is around L2, these are around L1. And you can't see this very well, but the, the ones that are the rectilinear ones are the ones that are closest to the moon, and on the L1 side, it reaches, the apolune reaches all the way down here. On the L2 side, they're a lot uh, smaller. So focusing on the L2 side, which has the apolunes that are more reasonable for what they want to accomplish, these two white guys, if you can barely see them there, actually bracket what is the 
rectilinear orbits that are candidates for this particular mission. Now, we, they're using the ones that are biased towards the south pole of the moon because the south pole of the moon is where there's most likely to be uh, human facilities in the future. So this is actually what the orbits uh, look like. Now, the ones that are very close to the moon, these guys, and both on the L1 and the L2 side, the L2 side in this particular region, of course, are not new. And I know in the 1970s, actually, Brakewell and Brown were already talking about these. These are the ones, um, they were talking about the ones on the northern side, but of course, the entire family is symmetric across the XC plane or the Earth moon plane. So they were just talking about the northern one and the ones they're using are the, are the southern ones that, that spend more time over the South Pole. There's another orbit that they're also looking at, um, and I'll talk about why that is in a second, but this one right here, and this is what they're currently calling in, in NASA ease, they're call, calling these the butterfly orbits. They're also not new, they've been around for quite a while. You'll notice that in this particular case, they sort of look like uh, butterflies, which is how they got that name, but they're also not new. These actually come from, back in, the, in 1980, Mark Kellison, um, their definition part of family F in their restricted three-body problem analysis. So these are not new, but you can see what they look like. Of course, this is again, um, for the orbits that they're interested in, they're looking at the symmetric family uh, across the plane, so these would, would dip down. So, why are these orbits um, good ones? Why do they want to use them, and what kind of things are being checked out now to a much greater extent than they ever have before? So as a staging orbit, what they want to do with this orbit is make sure that they have uh, capabilities, both relative to the Earth, relative to the Moon, but also with deep space access, and always keep in mind that the facility that they place there might be crewed. Now, as long as there's a crew on it, that introduces new challenges into designing the orbit and its capabilities. So that also enters into the design aspect because we have to take that into account at every step along the way. So it's supposed to have long-term operations for several years, so one of the reasons that these particular orbits were selected was because of the stability properties. So I'll look at that for just a second to talk a little bit about the fact that that, that is something that was attractive right from the beginning. So this is a different view of the family, and the red ones are the near rectilinear candidates. Um, as mentioned, they're uh, part of the halo family of orbits. They're largely in the YZ plane. That was also a key requirement. Uh, they pass close to the moon. That was important. The period is about six to 10 days, which is also useful. And they have this uh, linear type of stability, which is what was uh, a key requirement. So looking at them from a slightly different perspective, just looking at them in the YZ plane, uh, this is what we get. Notice that here's the moon, so they spend a lot of time here, which gives them a view of the South Pole, so that was important. Over on the right, there's this uh, looking at some of the stability index. Now I'm gonna define the index just as um, one half of the sum of the reciprocal uh, eigenvalues so that anything between minus one and one is linearly stable. But in this particular case, they're not com completely stable, but if you look at this chart, you see that the index only goes like to three. So anything in that pink region, which is what the red ones are, is defined as, as linearly stable for this application, and that's what they were really interested in. So that's, and that's also how they're defined or bounded, the range of orbits that they would use. These are the alternate orbits that they were also looking at, and they actually uh, bifurcate from the halo family. So the bifurcation of, is very close to uh, the edge. This guy, this green guy right here, is the bifurcating <coughs> orbit. The altitude is very low, which was desirable. So the bifurcating orbit is, is quite close there to the lunar surface. If you define these families in other systems, in other systems, sometimes this particular orbit might have a altitude at, at, at closest approach that's beneath 
the surface of the smaller primary, but in this particular case, it's not. And so that makes it a good uh, takeoff point. And so they're also looking at these. Now, because these are, they're from a period doubling bifurcation, so they have um, a period twice, but that's because they move down here. And so they like these for two reasons. One, because they have the same characteristics as far as the view of the South Pole. But they also give more coverage of the entire lunar surface. And so from an operations standpoint, that's uh, desirable. <laughs> Okay, so the other thing that is important in this type of application is the eclipse and how you can avoid shadows from both the Earth and the Moon during observations. So that's an important component of these particular type of trajectories. So when I talk about that, what I have to recognize is that not all of the orbits, of course, will have this. So if I look at the left here, I'm going to see in this particular chart, what this is, is looking at all the members of that family with an orbital period that's relative to the lunar period. And there's two that pop out that have acceptable uh, apolune, or parallel distances and that are resonant type uh, at, at both the 4 to 1 and the 3 to 1 resonance. So those are applicable. On the right, what we're looking at is relative to twice the orbital period, and there's one here that makes a, an appearance at a 3,100 kilometer paralune, and that is the 9 to 2 resonance. So both of these are, or all three of these are particularly desirable, and I'll talk about in a minute that they're, they're actually focused on the baseline is actually the 9 to 2. So the other thing that becomes important is Ah, that doesn't turn out very well, but the other thing that becomes important is once we start looking at both the eclipsing and the possibility that we have to be in these orbits for a long period of time, the idea of a staging orbit is that there'll be lots of things that rendezvous with them. And so the appearance of the orbit in the sun-moon rotating frame is actually a key thing. So the orbits are defined in the Earth-moon. But the sun-moon rotating frame is where we get the eclipse avoidance and what we're thinking about in these particular types of applications. So in this, these are views of the 4 to 1 sonotic resonance in the sun-moon rotating frame and the 3 to 1. These are not the ones that they would have chosen, but in, in this particular case, they would have been biased towards the 4 to 1 because in this particular view, we see that the... Ooh, we see that the, um, this is supposed to say oscillating argument of perigee, actually has, although they're resonant, so they both have predictable patterns, they actually have a lot smaller angular uh, variation in the four to one, and that's more desirable for rendezvous. Going back to the fact that it's in the sun-moon rotating frame, this is a view of the orbits in that frame which is for the eclipse avoidance. So in this particular frame, the three to one re resonant halo has this, looks like this in the inertial view, and this is what it is top down. So top down, you can see the resonance. This is the direction to the sun. And so we also have to be able to, for application, we have to be able to orient this orbit in this frame such that we can have a direction to the sun in these gaps. And so when you're talking about selecting the orbit and actually getting into it, you have to be able to get into it such that you have the right orientation. Now the orientation comes with timing or what dates that you're talking about. And so the orientation will change, for example, if I wanted to set, define the orbit on May 16th versus May 23rd, the orientation will change. So I have to, we have to be able to adapt to that. This is what it would look like once we shifted into the inertial frame. So this was the view in the rotating, or excuse me, in the circular restricted problem. The Earth-Moon circular restricted problem, but the view is in the Sun-Moon rotating frame. This is the view when we switch it to inertial. So when we got the inertial, excuse me, the ephemeris, by that I mean we moved into the ephemeris model, which includes the Earth, Moon, Sun, 
uh, Jupiter, and we see what we have to be able to accomplish when we go into that frame is we have to be able to still get the gaps, the appropriate gaps over here. So the direction to the sun, which is off to the left in this uh, top-down view, still reaches the gaps. And so the orientation is important. If, if we don't get the right orientation, then you have to add maneuvers all the time. And if we have something in this orbit for a very long period of time, you don't have to propel to do that. This is the three to one as it moved into ephemeris. And here is a better image of the gaps, although you can't see it all that well. Um, this dark line right here in the top-down view, this dark line is actually the lunar shadow. So that's what we're trying to avoid, and so we're trying to place the orientation so that it avoids the lunar shadow and we don't, the spacecraft never passes through the shadow. This is, of course, a, a larger view, and there's the shadow right here. <laughs> We also have to avoid the Earth's shadow, which means the orbit, even though we like the orbit, we also have to place the spacecraft and to orient the orbit appropriately by defining what date we would do that. And then we also have to avoid the Earth's shadow. The Earth's shadow passes up here because this will be the Earth-Moon plane. So we, it also has to be timed so the spacecraft is always down in this region of the orbit at the time when the Earth's shadow passes. So I, I don't have the movie, but I, but I think the idea is there. This is a, uh, in this particular case, this is a four to one, so you can see where the gaps is. The one that they actually like because the osculating argument of periapsis is smaller is the nine to two. This is what the nine to two looks like in that sun moon rotating frame once it's been moved into the ephemeris model. And it's a lot harder to avoid the shadows there. Now this one, we set it up purposely so it would cross through the shadow. And so these red pieces are where the spacecraft is passing through the lunar shadow because in the 9 to 2, it's a lot harder to place it with the gaps. Now there's typically a requirement that you can be in the shadow no more than 60 to 90 minutes at a time. And then there has to be a region of time between those gaps. Oh. So from that perspective, it's... I'm sorry for that. There we go. So keeping these, keep avoiding these becomes very important, especially it's a power consideration. So we have to be able to avoid those at all possible in this particular case, what we'd be looking at is a little bit of an adjustment to get rid of that if we can at all. So in general, these particular near the synodic resonant near rectilinear orbits actually have this feature that if we can place them properly, they're going to have, uh, their eclipse avoidance is going to be straightforward, so that's a positive thing. One of the other things that we have to do is be able to have access. We need access to the Earth, to the lunar surface actually, which although I'm not gonna talk about that today, but we also need access to other cislunar orbits. So first of all, the Earth. One of the things about these is that when we're talking about access to the Earth, we have to remember that even though these are halo orbits, they are, they're nearly stable. So one, we don't have stable manifolds really to use, and even if we did, the other halo orbits, this is the Earth-Moon system, so the stable manifolds don't go near the Earth because the Earth is the major primary. So in order to consider Earth access, we actually look at the three-body, uh, three-return tri type trajectories over here. The problem with them is if we look at this one right here and we can modify it so it actually reaches the apolune point of the orbit of interest, the problem is, is that it takes too much propellant to insert. So it costs too much. 800 meters per second is too much for a direct insertion in order into the sky. So we maybe need to use um, anything that will actually leverage the moon on the way. So we try to leverage the moon. This one is to a much smaller halo orbit. This one is only 5,000 kilometers out of plane. 
the ones that we're talking about are much greater. Oh, this didn't come out quite right. But in this particular case, if I only go to 5,000, uh, I can cut the insertion delta V significantly. However, um, this is only 5,000. As I start to move out of plane, I'm going to do a much worse job at that. So right now, this is the current baseline for how you would get into it. Here, this sort of is a looking straight down towards the Earth from the moon. So here's the Earth, here's the moon. And the way to solve your propellant problem is to use the moon. However, um, with the large out of plane that you've got with these guys, and you want to insert closer to Apollon because it costs you less. But currently, um, what they've got right now is they're going to be looking at this kind of an insertion right here. It does cut the insertion costs by 50%, so that helps. They also have a return here, um, by the way, so there's both a, an outbound and a return. But in, in doing that, if uh, you'll notice that this arrival is pretty much at 90 degrees. Um, sure, uh, you can calculate a 90 degree maneuver in order to accomplish that, but you're not going to be able to send a crew and do that. So in order to have a crew, uh, or in order to actually rendezvous, they want something that's closer to tangential arrival. So this is still going to take some work. The other thing though is we need um, access to other cislunar orbits in the area. So other types of orbits that have been mentioned they want a whole range of them. We know how to do this a lot. We have a lot of different kinds of transfers between orbits in this vicinity. And I know a lot of other people here have also looked at some of these that are both, you know, either like heteroclinic or they're small maneuvers and so on. So we have a lot of these available, but typically we've used stable or unstable manifolds in order to come up with ideas for how we could get into these orbits. They translate easily into the ephemeris frame, so we're not concerned with any about that. That works really well. But we don't have any stable manifolds when we're working with our RHOs that we can leverage in order to give us some insight in order to how to do transfers. We can move between the NRHO and one of these butterfly type orbits pretty easily because they're close. So even though I don't have any manifolds to use to do this, I can move between them because they're pretty close. These are just two quick examples. But when I get into some of the other ones, I'm going to have more of a problem because they're far away. In particular, just another example of those types of transfers, pretty cheap. You can see 40 meters per second. That's going to work really well. The timeline, 17 days, looks well. But I've got to go to other things like a DRO. So the DROs were actually, some of you may have heard, they were actually the baseline solution for the asteroid <coughs> redirect mission, which is now canceled. But that was um, the. Uh, that was one mission that was going to use a vehicle in a DRO. EM-1, remember, is also going into this particular type, one of these particular types of orbits. And EM-1, as a matter of fact, right now, is targeting one of these orbits that just is outside L1 and L2. But these guys, by definition, are also linearly pretty stable. So we've got the same problem there. <clears throat> But one of the high priorities for this staging orbit is that it can move back and forth between the very out-of-plane green one, which is the NRHO, and the very in-plane DROs. And so the transfers between those guys turn out to be one of their most important uh, requirements. When um, EM-1 is going into a DRO, when ARM, the other mission, was also going into there, moving back and forth, to the staging orbit to others of this kind becomes very important. So transfers here are also very important. So um, what we decided that we would do was leverage other orbits in the vicinity that did have stable and unstable manifolds. So in this particular case, if we utilize the DROs, ha also have period three DROs very much in the vicinity. So if we use a period 3 DRO at the same energy level, 
as the DRO that we're interested in. The DRO itself is linearly stable, but the period three is not. So we can use the period three guy here and use its stable and unstable manifolds to help give us a good idea of what the transfer should look like. So if we utilize that, and we have a small hyperplane here with the stable and unstable manifolds associated with the period three, and there's a really tiny green dot if you absolutely squint there, that's a candidate in our HO. We can utilize those together in order to come up with a transfer option. And so if we do that, that's exactly what we get in the Earth Moon view. And in this particular case, the time maybe takes too long, but this is a transfer between a 4 to 1 in our HO and a 12 day direct retrograde orbit. The transfer is a little bit long, but we can trim a little bit of it off and find an acceptable transfer between those two. So the first transfer that we have is actually 143 days. That exceeds their requirement a little. It's also a little bit expensive, but it does achieve the objective and, and we can work uh, from there. But the other option in this case is to leverage a low thrust engine in order to accomplish the same thing. So we look to, to do that. Oh, this didn't turn out, but it doesn't make any difference. So if we try to leverage a low thrust engine in order to accomplish the same objective, we can also get a transfer that does the job. Now, at this particular time, both in the previous case and in this case, the idea was not to leverage the lunar gravity, but that's going to be part of the future type of scenarios. But right here, this is a low thrust transfer that accomplishes the same objective. But there's a couple of issues with this, which is, first of all, if you look at that transfer over on the red, you don't have to, it doesn't matter too much what the details are, but there's a lot of red. Red means the engine is on, blue means the engine is off. So there's a lot of red. That means the engine is on a lot. And so that's not necessarily a good thing if we could do something else to leverage some of the natural <coughs> structures in that region, we should be able to cut this down. We also have to be able to predictably and reliably produce the transfers that look or that actually have the characteristics that we want. For those of you who are familiar with it, we use a co-location scheme to get this, but there's so many local minimums here that this is the one that it happened to land on. So it needs some help in order to do a better job. So in this particular case, having observed the solution that we had before, ah, that one, it looks like there's resonant properties here that we should be able to leverage. So in order to utilize the low thrust, we actually want to pick a resonant orbit, a, a different type of resonant orbit that we could use in order to see the strategy to find the transfer. And in this particular case, out of a lot of, of, of possibilities, in this particular selection of options, gray are planar type resonant orbits, and blue are out of plane uh, solutions that bifurcate from some of the planar ones. And in this particular case, we picked a two to three, and we're going to use a planar one, but it, we could use anything that we want, especially when we um, do more cases. So we're going to take and pick a member of this two to three family. And in this particular case, we're going to pick one that has a, you can't read that on the left, but it doesn't matter. Over here on the right, where you've got each Jacobi constant plotted. So this is Jacobi. And when we're looking at this, we've got the Jacobi associated with the rectilinear. We have the Jacobi associated with the value associated with the DRO. And this is um, for the resonant guy. And so this is the entire, the resonant family. So we pick the one that has a Jacobi value sort of between the other two. This is what it looks like. We also see the possibility that we may be able to eventually harness uh, a little more help from the moon. This is the up close part. The orbit itself, the resonant orbit itself comes in here close. We trim off part of it, so we're only gonna use the piece that actually arrives at the DRO. And this is the uh, resulting uh, possibility. Now, if you look at this, 
One of the advantages to doing this is that you don't see very much red. Okay, so that means that the engine is not on all that much, so we're using some of the natural motion in this general vicinity in order to help us. And so that works out pretty well. An important component <coughs> is to, of course, take this result and move it into the ephemeris model, which we do. The, the one here that is dashed is the one that came as a result of a circular restricted three-body type um, process. The ephemeris model essentially shifted this loop over here, which is fine. Um, depending on what dates we use to do that transition, we shift the loops uh, different kinds of ways. But it, it, the important part of this test was to know that it would shift uh, without problems to the uh, other orbit. So, there's a lot of other things that we need to look at, need to evaluate, and, and continue to work on. We've actually done um, some of the rest of this as well, but um, for the most part, everything that has thus far been analyzed, even the navigation, which I don't have up here, uh, reinforces their view that this is a good thing to use. It, it doesn't mean it will actually um, occur, but uh, current plan, and they're working very hard uh, in order to justify and find all the things that have to happen in a human problem, station keeping is, is a challenge because with a human vehicle and a human crew, the errors go up. But um, it turns out that station keeping, like in many halo type orbits, is actually very doable. So a number of other things. Uh, the international partners are very, very interested in access to the lunar surface, so that was also a consideration. And it, it turns out that, that they're working on that too. So that's my uh, summary. I have a number of references associated with all of this work, but um, hopefully we'll be able to use these kinds of orbits uh, in, in the human program as it moves forward. Thank you.